Welcome back to Myth Represented, where we seek to inform, entertain, and sometimes ridicule all of your favorite mythologies and sacred beliefs. We are finishing up on Greek here, and let's get right into it. Alrighty, um, episode three. We are going to wrap up Greek. We're going to make references to pop culture, modern movies, um, end times predictions that they had for... They didn't have an exceeding amount of end times predictions, did they really? Not really. Their actual mythology never really came to an end, as we'll see later with Ragnarok and Apocalypse things. But in doing research, you know, there was one thing that when you think Greeks and you think giant cataclysm, good old Atlantis always comes around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, and, and that's a popular one. It's it's often approached as a part of the mythology, but very uncommonly known, especially by people who keep looking for it and thinking they've found it, is it really never was. Yeah, it's the, Atlantis is a perfect kind of our segue for this episode, which includes, you know, the, I hope I say it right, eschatology. Eschatology. Yeah, that. The part of theology concerned with the final events of history, and then going into the pop culture references, for one story so long ago that may have been complete and utter bullshit or plagiarism, it's everywhere now. Between stories, video games, just um, fictional things to, like you said, people trying to find the damn thing. So it was, it was really, in a lot of ways, I, I, it was a fiction, an allegory. It was just kind of a whole mess to begin with. It was actually just a small part of one of Plato's writings that just kind of took off. Brief history in general, the whole, did he come up with it? Supposedly, it the singing of Atlantis happened, I believe, 9,000 years before Plato's account of it. And it's one of those, well, where did he hear it? it he heard it from, I believe, Critias, who heard it from Solon, who may have heard it from Egyptian, an Egyptian priest, who just, you know, found it laying around in hieroglyphics somewhere. So even that's kind of shady of where the info came from, even if it was something he actually heard. So this was sort of, it was passed down the grapevine. This was uh, like the old telephone game. Yeah. Part of it was kind of like a political thing, too. The whole story was that we think of it now as kind of this utopian society. That really didn't happen until more of the Renaissance, where they made it, this utopia, this advanced civilization, the it was mentioned their weapons and their naval fleet was advanced to the point where, according to Plato and some of the other accounts, the Atlanteans were pretty warfaring. They were conquering lands all over the world. The thing was, in the story that they apparently attacked Athens, and it was the only place they could not conquer. So it was gave Athens kind of this boasting right. So was it really something that happened, or was this just a, you know, little scheme to make Athens look good? Tell the story of this imaginary fleet going around conquering everyone, but oh, they didn't get us! We're awesome! <laughs> this is more like, almost like the idea that it was political rhetoric. Yeah. I, I've seen this run into a lot of that, reading about Atlantis, like trying to find actual accounts rather than stipulation and bizarre documentaries. There's no shortage of those. Um, the History Channel, when they started to deal a little bit less with history before they decided never to speak of history again and just do conspiracy theories. Not that I have a problem with that, but it's it really is steeped in people's minds that this wasn't just a part of a mythology, but this is something that had to have been real. It makes me wonder why, why people cling to that particular idea, and maybe it is the the fact that it was passed down so much from one person to the next, it makes people think, well, this had to come from somewhere. But passed on that far, it couldn't be accurate. Yeah. It's probably only loosely based on something that may have actually happened. It was interesting how it, they did get it to fit some of their myths. I mean, Atlantis itself meant the land of Atlas, which we have mentioned in the last two shows, Atlas being one of the titans, one of the asshole titans. Um... Somewhere along the line between, you know, holding up the heavens and keeping his parents from banging for the rest of eternity, this was his island. Poseidon and Cleto had five sets of twins. They were mortals, they were humans, and these were supposedly the 
kings of Atlantis. There wasn't just one, there was a five sets of twins. And then there's stories of their main capital, their main citadel, what have you, was in the center of these weird ringed islands and these canals in the center of Atlantis. I kind of acted as, uh, you know, good old medieval moats. I'm sure they were filled with alligators and such to keep away their enemies. One of the other odd little things about it was things were just made of gold. Apparently just gold was everywhere. But also the Atlanteans built a lot with brass, tin, and kind of a mythical metal or calcum, which we'll talk about in some of our references of the hours upon hours looking for that in Skyrim. (laughs) <laughs> but apparently they were like number one in orcalcum sales and smithing. One of the interesting things, reading part of uh, research for this, I believe in 2015 in Sicily, they found a copper-zinc alloy that kind of fits the bill for this orcalcum. So there's, like you said, this thing that it's this old story that keeps coming back. It's one of those stories that there's just enough little pieces and details here and there that someone can grasp onto and go, well, it had to be real. Look at this. Well, this is real. Or look at this tiny fact. And I mean, that's, you have that a lot with these legends, but of, with no regular mythology, you have some of the just, you believe it because you do. But where Atlantis, it's just something people not even concerned with mythology or hell-bent on finding this place. Where Plato mentioned uh, outside the, or through the, what was it, the Pillars of Hercules, obviously named after the Atlantic Ocean, named after Atlas as well, so figured it would be floating around there. Well, obviously, we haven't found a giant, because if it sank, there should still be something there. I mean, you have even the 50s with Edgar Cayce, uh, Psychic saying it was in, uh, around Bermuda. Every, isn't everything at one point purported to be in Bermuda, though? Uh, yeah, and, and when in doubt, you find anything near water that's slightly questionable, it... It's the new Atlantis at this point. It's talking about how people keep finding bits of evidence and just clinging to it. Well, there's this, there's that. And that's the funny thing is any kind of legend or myth or any sort of fiction naturally draws on factual information. There's always a fact. There's always something that inspired it. And it's inevitable with the number of alloys, especially in that era that people were working with. Like metallurgy was... A big science people were working with. You, know, you have Bronze Age. They're they're really starting to mix and match. So it's inevitable that someone would stumble upon something or a calcum like. And because mythologies, when when somebody makes up a lost city, they're not making up things that are that fantastical. They are going to say, well, they're leading in the production of this particular metal. And then inevitably, someone will find that metal and want to link it. I think it's more the desire to make connections. That's a huge instinct in the human brain, is people want to connect one thing to another. So it's easy to say, well, this must have been Atlantis. This must have been the metal they used. This must be the location. Because we, we really do draw from real-life experiences when making a myth. I think that's why it's so easy to, to think that something, even if it was a story, just a story that was passed on, to want to find the reality behind it. And then it's easy to go from finding the reality it sprang from to saying, well, maybe it was all real. Mm. It's like, if, 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 I, if I made up a story, and in that story, like, it, there could be, like, unicorns and robots and stuff, and, and people shooting That's lasers out of their fingers. <laughs> people, there are some crazy ideas of what it was. It was I mean, it, we all know it was aliens. It's always aliens. It was just riddled by alien robots riding laser eyed unicorns. That's what I learned. That's what I learned from the documentary Stargate Atlantis. And it was just people were always finding these little links. I could make up a story, a fictional story with all these ridiculous elements, but if in the story part of it takes place in an actual place and then someone goes to that town, the first thought shouldn't be, well, maybe the unicorns, finger lasers, and robots were all real, too. It should be, oh, here was the inspiration for that story. But that's that's another the big thing, the big difference between science and mythology slash religion. It's, it's not looking for the evidence to show you what happened. It's trying to fit the evidence in what you want the history to be. No, no offense to, uh, to religions or anything. I, I don't, I don't want to like prompt a beheading or anything, but 
sometimes we, we do try to cram the facts into something like this. So that's why I think Atlantis is so widely regarded by many people to be some fact waiting to be discovered. Well, even, as we mentioned, many myths in general, getting back to the kind of political rhetoric of, oh, you know, Atlantis was so powerful, but yet it couldn't beat Athens. The whole story in itself, again, piecing it in with the Greek mythology we know, the gods, they liked, you know, vengeance and punishment and keeping human beings in place. This was the perfect story for that. You know, this society that was perfect and was doing so well, and they started getting a little, doing a little too well, and possibly a little too pompous and a little too warfaring. As the story goes, the gods decided, you know what, Atlantis, you guys are a bunch of dicks. You're acting like dicks. You're not playing very nice with the rest of the world. So we're going to sink your asses. And here comes from volcanoes to typhoons, not that asshole monster typhoon we spoke of before, actual weather typhoons, tidal waves, and they just sunk the bitch. You are no longer worthy. You are the weakest link. Under the ocean you go. So, yeah, sounds like a great story, climactic ending, but it's also, again, kind of fits in with that, yeah, just, you know, do good, you know, worship us. If you start to act like an asshole, we're going to wipe you out. It was pretty much the gods creating mass genocide on this entire people. But in, you know, some attestations, they sound like they deserved it. But with that, like I said, the, there wasn't, an insane amount of detail. It wasn't later, much till much later in the Renaissance, where it became this, you know, not only technolo technology from more metaphysical things, where they all had magical powers, were they wizards, were they automatons, they had giant lasers, you know, robots and unicorns and lasers. But that's where the story really started to get weird and branch off into books and things and now into modern day where you have it everybody you mentioned Atlantis someone has a picture of it whether it's a version of just some ancient Greek city that might be slightly shinier than the usual or to people riding around in hovercrafts and dragons and lord knows what that, that what you're saying about how it was they just got a little too big for their britches as humanity. That That is, as we mentioned before, a running theme in Greek mythology. And if there is an end times, I mean, it seems, it seems it's more a series of disasters than a final end times that they have. And it's more just, if you get too big, Zeus is going to kick you down a few notches. Which, looking at our society now, I imagine any time more than ever he'd want to kick us down. So, who knows? Maybe, uh... Everything that goes wrong from here on out is just Zeus kicking us back down. Oh crap, they're calling for a lot of rain this weekend. Yeah. Oh, are we going to sink at like Atlantis? Waterfall? Probably. I don't see why not. I mean, we're really far inland, and, and there's not enough water in the world to flood us up to this point. But Last magic checked, Zeus water. That's true. And Zeus stuff. If, if something, if the bottom of the ocean rises up in the middle of the sea, it could then flood by displacing the water. Oh, well, beside, can do that. Oh, well, then we're all screwed. Yeah. All right, so I won't be making it into work this weekend. <laughs> so it just seems just a general kicking down, hubris of humanity, an ongoing series of small apocalypses, small end events. This makes me think about Pompeii, too. I know that Roman mythology is so, so it's pretty much just rehashed Greek with other things thrown in. But, you know, I was thinking of Pompeii, the whole island buried in volcanic ash. Or No, that wasn't an island, that was a coastal. They just got buried, and of course there's like talk of that. I, I've even heard people trying to link Pompeii to Atlantis, but the timeline doesn't quite work out with that. Well, not that people concern themselves with details such as something occurring after a thing was written. That's just... History, everything before 200 years ago happened simultaneously in some people's eyes. That's the difficulty with trying to unravel myths. But from Atlantis eating us from pseudo-end times to, well, just taking out a bunch of arrogant a-holes, to modern myths, pop culture. This is where we're going to get a brunt of the information for this episode. It's There's just so much of it. And 
that this is the thing when people think mythology, Greek is one of the first things that pops to mind along with. I and mean, those are pretty much like the big things that people, at least in this area, always think of with mythology. Yeah, we could do multiple episodes trying to cover it all from music, cinema, even video games alone we could do. Greek mythology is just everywhere. It's the, the go-to when you want some sort of mythical name or figure Gods in your of whatever. War. Oh, yeah. yeah. God of War is uh, a big example. Very violent, very brutal game, but very violent and brutal mythology. You don't often see Greek mythology depicted the way that, as being that dark and violent, but it really is. It, it, it was a mythology of war. There's so much war and violence. I mean, things cutting heads off, being eviscerated by a bird over and over again. It really was, it gets cleaned up a lot in pop culture, which is where you get things like Disney's Hercules, where there just wasn't, I think I saw some purple goo, but not really a lot of actual blood. And it's, of course, you know, to make it a kid-friendly movie, that's what you're going to do, but the depictions of deities are always very archetyped. And I feel like in Greek mythology, you didn't, you didn't have a lot of this. Uh, people weren't real stereotypically good or evil, but in in the modern, they were very much. Greek mythology was very much. They were just people with godlike power. They were complicated. No one was really good. No one was evil. Everyone was just really sort of messed up in their own unique way. But then you watch, you know, say Disney's Hercules. There are very clearly evil, very clearly good characters. They they very much push them into the modern Disney archetypes. Um, Clash of the Titans. There were two of those made. I, I saw the original. I actually never did see the new Clash of the Titans. I was told that I should probably find something better to do with my time. Did you ever see it? Yeah. Oh, so you, you can cover that out. I'd like to cover the old one. I loved it. The, the, the crappy stop-motion animation, the super cheesy acting, It and it, you know, it did get a bit violent and terrifying the creatures i don't know if it was just that uncanny valley nature of the animations used with the models but the creatures always terrified me i rewatched them recently in preparation for this some bits and pieces and they're still just creepily terrifying what the hell was that owl um could not find anything any robot owls in i think that was just you know the the creator of the movie the script writer has to add their own little thing so you choose a damn robot owl? Yeah, you know, it's it's period. It's not it's not related at all. I don't know where it came <laughs> from. I don't know. If, uh, now now in that period of the eighties, people were uh, they were experimenting with a lot of crazy drugs. So I like to think Dionysus and Hephaestus were hanging out. A lot of wine, a lot of tinkering with weird stuff. Out popped a robot owl. That makes sense. Uh, that's Hephaestus canon robot for. Owl. Um, Greek mythology now. Redcon. <laughs> so I'm trying to think of some of, again, we could spend numerous episodes on this, but we're just going to figure out and name and list and talk about some of our favorite shows, movies, video games, franchises that have to do with Greek mythology. I know one of the ones, not a whole lot, but we're big Supernatural fans. Yeah, um... That was one disappointing episode in the show Supernatural where they met the gods, and I was excited. I was like, oh, this could be a whole season's worth of stuff with the gods, the all of mythology, the deities, the powerful things. But sadly, um, it they became just another monster that eats humans. Yeah. And, and I was like, okay, I, I, that was my thing. I was like, I'm like, okay, we've seen a lot of monster... Here's a thing we call a monster. It eats humans. We have to kill it because it eats humans. I was like, oh, gods, this will be different. And they're like, no, they're a mo- the thing. We call them monster. We call them gods, and they eat humans. And that, that got me because it, it, I felt it was – they probably had a good, like, five or six seasons worth of – they could have done a whole other series just with the gods. Oh, yeah. Then I, this is a show that I will follow into its hundredth season. But this was one thing that drove me nuts is – they're versions of the gods. When I saw Hermes, you know, with, I believe, an entire severed head on a platter. <laughs> if anybody's going to eat a severed head, Hermes is going to be the last one. 
Mm-hmm. It what? doesn't make sense. But also, like, the, the mythology with, uh, if, if that's what gods are in general, why were there figures from Chinese mythology where Buddhism was a huge thing, cannibalism was incredibly looked down upon, and there aren't really even necessarily gods in some of the more Eastern religions. You have you have deities of sorts, but they're oftentimes elevated humans. So it, it was, there was a lot of... Zeus has done a lot of weird shit in his day, but mm-hmm. eating people, I have not found anything. The only kind of embitterment on that, um, there was a later episode with Prometheus, where they kind of left the whole gods are just monsters, and they actually, the two main characters, Sam indeed helped Prometheus try to escape from Zeus. Who, yeah, they made Zeus a kind of an asshole in this, but I do believe they ended up freeing Prometheus, and I don't think they ever mentioned really that he was a titan, but at least they didn't try to kill him immediately. And they didn't make the character a man-eating monster, literally. There were a lot of a lot of deities that were depicted as man-eating monsters. So if all of them were, why would there have... So it's, and, and for all the research that show does, I was a little disappointed that that was not... That was something that just seemed like someone insisted on the idea and someone else wanted to bury it, maybe. So that maybe it was made that way to sort of shut someone up from wanting the gods. <laughs> oh, I, I just looked up in Clash of the Titans, the robot owl, Bubo. Bubo? Bubo, yes. So, Athena had a beloved owl of the same name, and yes, Hephaestus forged the robot owl and sent sent him along to aid Perseus in his quest to save the princess Andromeda. That, yes, the... the I, I was remembering that, but I was like, I don't want to say anything till I double-check it, because I couldn't remember. But yes, Hephaestus made that robot owl. Yes! Yeah, you, you called it. Very nice, good that there. thing's legit. It doesn't say... That's what it says right here. Whoa! Bubo was forged by Hephaestus. Right, right there, that is the Clash of the Titans wiki. Um, I, remember, yeah. I remember reading about that. I know my deformed metallurgy deities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One thing with Greek mythology pop culture we have to mention is the classic, what do I want to say, 90s, Hercules and Xena, Kevin Sorbo and Lucy Lawless. Oh, yeah. God, those were my guilty pleasure. It was Kevin Sorbo. Yeah, uh, Lucy Lawless, Jesus. And Yeah, those are two, they are two people who were just born to be in mythological... Oh, was it Call the Conqueror was another big one I used to watch, but it was a lot yeah. of inspiration there. But I, I know I never saw Hercules and Athena. And Xena was my oh, favorite. It was, it was Hercules and Xena? Yeah, Xena, Warrior oh, Princess. Was, I thought you said Athena. No. Oh, so Xena oh, actually, that. there was a crossover. Okay. No. Tell me, tell me about this. Hercules, I need to hear about it. I believe, started first. Um, he had, as you know, it was like a, almost a little buddy comedy with his friend Aeolus. The mythology, eh, watching it as a kid, you just kind of went with it because there was pretty decent effects for the day's monsters, and um, I believe that's where Xena came from, and it became a spinoff. Xena was not based off of anything. She was not mythologically canon, but damn was she badass, and uh, some lesbianic shit going on, which just made it awesome. Uh, (laughs) Bruce Campbell was a reoccurring uh, character. Why did I never watch this? Oh my god. It, it, Huge Bruce Campbell fan. It went from, like, fun to dark to campy, back to dark again, some lesbianism, like back life. to campy. Yeah, it was amazing. There was, a, I heard rumor, you know, they were trying to get it redone, Lucy Lawless would do it again. She is aged like a fine wine made by Dionysus himself. She's still friggin' hot. Some of these, some of these people have to have Dorian Gray paintings stored away. I know David Bowie's got to have one. <laughs> but I believe she was just in Agents of Shield last season, and yeah, still I'm sure would fit into that tiny Xeno armor, do her funny little yell, and kick some ass and make out with some chicks. <laughs> that that would be fun. But I think that even gave a spinoff. I believe Fox Kids had a young Hercules later, mm. uh, but. I, I don't know whatever really happened with that. There's, there's a name we're hearing a lot in, in, in all this pop culture stuff. Hercules is always the one who pops up. I, I think his story of all of them is, of course, the most relatable because it, it is that hero's quest, and it is that you're 
a human being in a sense, but you have some divine ancestry. And there's, there's this that dream of, you know, that being someone special, overcoming adversity. He had specifics that these are the quests you must overcome. It's very appealing. And that, that seems to be the one that always pops up in mm-hmm. pop culture. Even he's a Marvel comic superhero. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting, you know, we'll mention it later, you know, in our pop culture reference episode for Norse mythology of Thor. But that opened up, as him being a main superhero, it opened up the door to have gods from multiple pantheons in the Marvel Universe. And, you again, it's a lot of Norse as primary characters, but Hercules himself, is his, he's, I think, on and off heroes for hire, may have been in and out of the Avengers for a while. Even the Greek pantheon, I believe, or last I heard in Marvel, they're more of a, uh, kind of like a mafia. Huh. They've kind of come to this human world and doing things. So, that, that's kind of fun. I'm a big Marvel fan, so. Imagine, I'm, that. now imagine them all with like, like fedoras or in track suits <laughs> sitting around and like in the backs of warehouses Eating, eating lavish meals in uh, in little bistros, little Greek bistros. Sticking with some of the 90s stuff, one of my all-time favorite cartoons, Gargoyles. Now, in itself, not a lot of mythology. Well, here and there they did some Egyptian, a lot of stuff was mentioned. There was one episode that was actually supposed to be a kind of pilot for an offshoot series. It was when Goliath, his daughter, I believe Alicia, and I think the dog one, Bronx, were going around the world traveling, and they stumbled upon, it was very similar to kind of Atlantis, but it was called New Olympus. And on this island, it was basically populated by offsprings of Greek, from Greek deities to Greek heroes. Um, I believe one of the main characters was actually voiced by uh, Worf. Oh. Um, That show was just any Star Trek. If you were on Star Trek, you were probably also on Gargoyles. (laughs) But anyway, he was the offspring of the Minotaur. There was just, like I said, countless mythological references. And I remember as a kid thinking this was really cool. And to later find out this was almost a series in itself... I would have watched the hell out of that. I, I never really saw a lot of that series. Uh, now, yeah. now I want to see it, though. Where are you going to find it? I'm the, I'm the son of a Trekkie. Yeah. It was... I had started as, I think, the guy who played Riker and Deanna Troy were two main characters. And then it just went into... I can't even remember how many characters ended up on that show. And it wasn't just... It was mostly Star Trek Generation, and then Catherine Janeway from Voyager was on it. It was crazy, but amazing. But unfortunately, the New Olympus show never took off. It would have been amazing. We could have talked another probably two hours about that, but (laughs) bastards. So I know one of the more, I'm not even sure what year it came out, but kind of the darker aspect, the graphic novel that you've been into, which is comprised primarily of... Oh, the Sandman series? Yes, the Sandman series, actually one of the biggest plot arcs involves Greek mythology. The main character, um, for those who have not read it, read it. And it's... it's by I Neil, have homework. It's, it's, uh, they're sitting right there. There they are. You're going to oh, read hell. it. Hell. I don't have all of them, but it's Neil Gaiman. He basically wrote this monomyth of sort of the, the first gods of humanity. And they are based on... There's destiny and Dream, and death, desire, despair. They all start with D. That's a little running gag that's referred to a no- number of times. But Dream is... The, the character Sandman is Dream. And he's the titular character of the series. And in it, he is the father of Orpheus in Greek mythology. They, are, they tie into mythology in numerous ways. Sometimes they... If there is a god of dreams, he'll appear to somebody who worships those gods as that god. So he got tied into the Greek mythology. He had his son Orpheus. Orpheus was mostly killed to where he was just a head. And 
you know, would just kind of sit there singing beautifully. And this, this was very much meant to appeal to the goth scene. So, of course, he was a, a tormented, elf-faced male with uh, who sang beautifully all day and just wished for the release of death. Eventually, a little bit of a spoiler, Dream goes, speaks to him, and he releases him. He kills him. And if you remember from what we said of the Furies, you kill a family member, that's it. This was all sort of being orchestrated. Someone wanted to take him out, and they got this all to happen, got the attention of the Furies, and they went after him. And this is this is how the big his big final arc is very much between him and the Furies. There's so much tie-in with Greek mythology right there, but that's actually where I first heard of the Furies, before I really knew a lot about Greek mythology, is from that comic. And they had the... Neil Gaiman's very good with accuracy and digging up obscure things. He will find deities that you had no idea existed. I mean, they were vicious, they were unforgiving, unrelenting, and they had the whips of scorpions and everything. So that, that was a particularly good depiction of mythology right there. Not, not a lot of plot holes, not a lot of inconsistencies from the original texts. That's, that's, that's one thing I always... I don't, I don't always feel that something is better because it has more accuracy. Sometimes deviating from the original text makes it better. Mm. Sometimes you turn them all into man-eating beasts. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> sometimes it depends on how much you deviate and why you deviate. But Neil Gaiman's always been a great writer of a sort of where are they now of mythology. So highly recommend the Sandman series, um, the Kindly Ones. This, this is where a lot of the Greek mythology ties in. So that's basically some of our favorite with pop culture references. Now, oh, I I never saw it, but with the whole Percy Jackson thing. What was the... Did you ever see that? I made it through the first one. Once I saw okay. Kronos emerge with devil horns, oh. I was... Up until that point, it wasn't awful. But there was one thing in our research that... A movie that we found that we had to actually sit down and watch. It was beautiful in a horrible, horrible way. <laughs> A friend of mine who is a huge fan of cheesy movies and a huge fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger, my friend Chad, is like, you've got to see Hercules in New York. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger's first movie. They actually overdubbed his voice originally because he was so hard for people to understand. If you watch the original undubbed where he talks in, in his, at that time, very thick Austrian accent, there is one scene where you hear him talk through a radio and it's the overdub voice, so that, that throws people off a little bit, you know. It's, it's, it is so ridiculous, so cheesy. Everyone in it is just like, they're, it's, it's, they're all like cartoon characters. The expressions people make, the things they do, it was just so beautifully awful. The basic plot was, Hercules is bored. That's it. He got bored. So as punishment, Zeus zaps his ass to the middle of New York. He, he wants to see humanity. He wants to see Earth. And Zeus is like, fine, you'll see Earth. Here we go. Boom, Central Park. There you are. I believe he was picked up by a cab driver. Yeah, and then he didn't have money. And there was a... Oh, no, it was... Uh, no, they found him in the ocean. That's what it was. And they bought him on board. That's right. And then the pretzel... Pretzi, the pretzel vendor, finds him and is his, his sidekick. And sort of the, the person who is guide in this crazy new world... I love the fact that that he very much Hercules does not know what's going on. He's a fish out of water, but every other deity who pops down knows. Like they're like, oh, they they pop down there and what was it? I I remember um, Hades appears and he dresses in contemporary clothing and he just pops. He was up. pretty badass looking in that yeah. movie. But I, I kind of get the idea that all the gods really know about Earth and they know they're. They can pop down there and be fine, but Hercules is just, knows nothing about it. He has no idea what's going on, and he is kind of buffoonish, but in an oddly lovable way. Like, how does he not know how a restaurant works? And it's, it's just kind of like he just wasn't paying attention. He's so, uh, it's, it's a ridiculous, ridiculous I movie. just like all the power the gods have to actually travel 
to the Earth realm, mm -hmm. they have to just plummet from the sky. <laughs> Hercules did it first, and I believe at the end, Zeus even decides, oh, that looked fun. I'm going to try it. Now, Zeus, do you think he could just, you know, poof himself down there? Nope. Drops down, I believe dressed as a rabbi for some reason. <laughs> You, they did not have much of a budget to speak of, and the best is when they're in Olympus, and you can tell they just angled, they just filmed it in Central Park and angled the camera just right, because they're there talking, they're standing at the throne of Zeus, and you can hear cars beeping in the background. <laughs> you hear, like, cars beeping, dogs barking. It's like someone made this, someone made this for college. I love that his lightning bolts were zigzagged arrows rebar. made of re welded rebar that was painted. I was so excited. Who knew the Cyclops that, that forged his weapons? It wasn't out of electricity. It wasn't out of... They just had rebar. Bro. What do we do? Zeus has got to fight with something. Just take a piece of rebar. Eh, eh. Yeah, there we go. Throw this. For as cheesy and awful as it was, it, it was very accurate in the depictions of God's personalities. They were more... They were very much like people. They were very uh, conniving in some ways, and it's that—that's what made it so great. In spite of the fact of how awful the production was and how awful, awful the acting was, it was—it was junior high school level acting. But they were very accurate with a lot of the mythology, save for one moment yeah. where they—we need to send somebody to help him. Okay, Atlas. Um, from what I recall, not the first person who'd want to help Hercules. Not at all. So, of course, they'll send him to fight. And he'll... and Samson, who is not from Greek mythology at all. He is a hero from the Bible who would not... Now, he, um, Samson, a little deviation here, is a Natsiri. Uh, basically, it means like a sanctified one. Um, also, he, he didn't have really long hair. Yeah, he Samson, had short hair. Samson had very long locks. That was his shtick. That was the whole point. He, Without that, you don't have... You can't be fighting alongside yeah. of Hercules. You, you cut that. You a crew cut. When, you cut. when a Natsiri cuts their hair, their vow has ended. That's how you finish. You, you make your vow, I'm going to do this for this many years. His was for life. He was never to cut his hair. And when he cut his hair, his vow was ended. And that, that, that's an odd thing right there, that they, for all the research, I'm like, you did so good, guys. And then you threw in Samson, who would never have gone to help a pagan <laughs> god unless women were involved. Now, if someone said, I'm wondering if maybe that's what they did. They're like, hey, Samson. Also, he was, he was dead, but I mean, he was dead. Yeah. He's a dead dude. So he, I, I'm thinking what they were like, is he probably got seduced into it. Because that's, that's pretty much how anything with Samson ever happened was through seduction. He was he was actually fairly easy to control in that sense. Now going into, you know, Greek and modern times, we have to get into science. Especially astronomy. We have, you know, first of all it's just some of the sciences. It's been an inspiration for a lot of names, mostly spates of good, you know, the Apollo mission. But you have the planets. Now that's kind of a mess. All of our planets named after Roman, except one, planet Uranus, which is Greek. We talked about him being Kronos' dad, got his nuts chopped off. But where they went with the planets, and, you know, Pluto, the dwarf planet, whatever we're going to call it. Well, the moons, um, there's different asteroids named after... The moons are what got crazy. Um, most of the moons are... Greek, especially Saturn and, I believe, Jupiter. Jupiter being named after Zeus. So, what they did was the first, I believe, four moons discovered, they named after Zeus's lovers. Ganymede, Callisto, Io, I cannot think of the fourth one. Callisto. Okay, okay. So, in the entire solar system, we even branch into later, there's moons named after Norse deities, ones named after uh, characters from Shakespeare. But of all the Greek names mentioned, all the things named, whether it would be Roman or Greek, not one Hera. <laughs> in, and we talked about in the mythology before, Hera always getting screwed over. She's Zeus's wife, and she's pretty much the only one Zeus isn't banging and having extra children with. I just thought that was amusing. You know, the first... Maybe the first moon could have been named after her. Nope. 
we're going to name it after his mistresses instead. And then just never name a moon after her. Or anything. <laughs> I mean, at least at least name a piece of space debris after her. I think she may have gotten an asteroid or something. We will have to fix that and put that in later. But it was just like, wow, poor Hera gets screwed again. Um, again, many space missions, probes, satellites all bear the names of from Greek heroes to Greek gods. We even have some of the elements. I was just about to say elements. Tantalum, after Tantalus. Niobium, after the daughter, his daughter Niobe. And then you've got Prometheum. Yay! Prometheus, one of my favorites. And, obviously, Titanium. Very strong metal named after the Titans because, you know, everything was named after, you know, Titanic. Everything. Because Titans were big and strong, but they were really a bunch of douchebags. <laughs> So we've managed to cover from some of our favorite shows, movies, to, you know, our favorite thing. We sit around and talk about space all the time because we are cool. We're that kind of cool. Want to go play football? Go pick up some chicks at the bar? No, we're going to hang out and talk about X-Men and space. So that is pretty much, we are covered for our purposes, Greek slash Roman mythology. We will continue our cycle of a show of beginnings, a show of our favorite legends, and ending with the end times of pop culture. We will be continuing and or our show going into Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. So that will be a lot of fun. Hopefully you will stick around and um, are not tired of us yet and would like to listen to us because we are fun and nice and sweet and lovable and uh, we're we're sexy. We're I'll just tell you, yeah, we're we're sexy as hell, and uh, entertaining. irrationally so. Yeah, yeah. So we are myth represented. Hopefully, we will have you listeners back for the next episode. Hooray! Yay! <coughs>